Good morning, and welcome on this first Sunday in June to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Brunswick, Maine. My name is Penny Elwell, and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees at UUCB. We are pleased to be joined this morning by the First Parish of Berlin, Massachusetts. I want you to know that our Charity with Soul for June is Maine All Care. Maine All Care, a nonpartisan, not-for-profit education and advocacy group, promotes establishment of publicly funded health care coverage for all Maine residents. It advocates that health care be treated as a public good since it is fundamental to our well-being as individuals and as a democratic state. Your contributions are welcome online through our website or through the mail. It is necessary for me to conclude this morning's welcome with the reading of the warrant for the upcoming congregational meeting of UUCB. The Unitarian Universalist Church of Brunswick hereby notifies all current members to attend a congregational meeting to be held online via Zoom conference on the 13th of June, 2021 at 11 a.m. to consider and act on the following articles. Number one, to approve the minutes of the congregational meetings of June 7th, 2020, January 21st, 2021, and April 18th, 2021. And number two, to approve the board's recommended budget for fiscal year 2021-2022. And three, to receive the nominating committee's report and elect trustees for open seats, church offices, moderator, nominating committee for 2021 and four, to consider any other business as appropriate and agreed to by the assembled congregation. And now again, welcome. Summer in Maine is booming, restrictions are easing, and we're so appreciative of being together this morning. walking on you go though the final destination is never ours to know seeing through the distance that's not for you and me and it's not a place to get to it's a place to be in fear Don't you listen to those voices whisper in your ear Today we wake alone just like every other day empty and frightened and with a choice to make to keep walking Studying the world well, That can only go so far As 
Sometimes you gotta reach up and take down your guitar to keep walking. May the beauty we love be what we do. May the love that we find see us through. Till the beauty we love proves this thing we found. There's at least a hundred ways to kneel and kiss the ground. So keep walking. Good morning, dear ones. It is good to be with you. I am delighted to welcome some visitors that we have here with us this morning from Berlin, Massachusetts. Berlin is the town right next door to Northboro, where Dale and I live. And I have been a friend of the Berlin congregation for many years. Their minister is currently on parental leave, so they have been visiting other congregations over these weeks, and technology makes it possible for them to be here in Brunswick without the tolls or the traffic. So it is good to be together. I hope that those of you visiting from Berlin will stay for coffee hour on Zoom immediately following worship. Nothing pleases me more than having people I love get to know one another. So come, let us be together in worship and let us sing together our opening song, Amazing Grace. Hello and good morning. My name is Tobin and I serve as your Director of Religious Exploration. Today I am wearing my Rainbow Heart shirt in honor of Pride Month, which celebrates LGBTQI people. I'm also wearing it because today's story is about 
how sometimes we go through a hard or stormy time, and on the other side of that time, there's often a rainbow. I hope you enjoy. There is a rainbow, written by Teresa Tinder, with pictures by Grant Snyder. A story has a beginning and an end. Where there is a here, there is a there. And there is something in between. On the other side of the screen, there is a school. On the other side of a window, there is a neighbor. On the other side of the street, there is help. On the other side of town, there is a voice. On the other side of a river, there is light. On the other side of a mountain, there is a path. On the other side of sadness, there are hugs. On the other side of a storm, there is a rainbow. On the other side of today, there is tomorrow. Hi, I'm Joni Bergen. I'm a member of First Parish in Berlin. Justine and I met many years ago because a wise UU district executive thought we might collaborate well together on a project she was managing. And uh, from that, an enduring friendship was born. This reading is by Jan Richardson. It's called, How the Stars Get in Your Bones. Sapphire, diamond, emerald, quartz. Think of every hard thing that carries its own brilliance, shining with the luster that comes only from unaccountable ages in the earth, in the dark, buried beneath unimaginable weight, bearing what seemed impossible, bearing it still. And you, shouldering the grief you had thought so solid, so impermeable, the terrible anguish you carried as a burden now become, who can say what day it happened, a beginning. See how the sorrow in you slowly makes its light, how it conjures its own fire. See how radiant even your despair has become in the grace of that sun. Did you think this would happen by holding the weight of the world, by giving in to the press of sadness and time. I tell you, this blazing in you, it does not come by choosing the most difficult way, the most daunting. It does not come by the sheer force of your will. It comes from the helpless place in you that despite all cannot help but hope. The part of you that does not know how not to keep turning toward the world to keep turning your face toward this sky, to keep turning your heart toward this unendurable earth, knowing your heart will break, but turning it still. I tell you, this is how the stars get in your bones. This is how the brightness makes a home in you. As you open to the hope that burnishes every fractured thing it finds and sets it shimmering, a generous light that will not cease, no matter how deep the darkness grows, no matter how long the night becomes. Still, 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 the secret of secrets keeps turning in you, becoming beautiful, 
becoming blessed, kindling the luminous way by which you will emerge carrying your shattered heart like a constellation within you, singing to the day that will not fail to come. Thank you for that reading, Joni. And now let us enter into a time of meditation and prayer. Let yourself sit back, feel your feet on the ground. Take a few slow, deep breaths. Our meditation this morning is sung it is a beautiful song written by Jeannie Gagné called In My Quiet Sorrow. I had the great pleasure of singing and recording this song with our own Grace Lewis McLaren right here in this sanctuary on our piano. In My Quiet Sorrow by Jeannie Gagné. For the Hardest Days by Clint Smith. Some evenings, after days when the world feels like it has poured all of its despair onto me, when I am wa awash with burdens that rest atop my body like a burlap of jostling shadows, I find a place to watch the sunset. I dig my feet into a soil that has rebirthed itself a million times over. I listen to the sounds of leaves as they decide whether or not it is time to descend from their branches. It is hard to describe the comfort one feels in sitting with something you trust will always be there, something you can count on to remain familiar when all else seems awry. How remarkable it is to know that so many have watched the same sunset before you. How the wind can carry pollen and drop it where it has never been. How the leaves have always become the soil that then becomes the leaves again. How maybe we are not so different from the leaves. How maybe we are always also being reborn to be something more than we once were. How maybe that's what waking up each morning is, 
a reminder that we are born of the same atoms as every plant and bird and mountain and ocean around us. I found myself thinking recently about horror movies. Not really my favorite genre, but you know, there's kind of a formula. There's some great threat, 
a creature from out of space, some ferocious wild animal that's gotten loose, or maybe a sinister criminal lurking. There are wise people who try to warn others about the threat, but at first, anyway, most people don't listen. Some people deny or minimize the threat, and in the movies, those people are often the ones who suffer some way unless they finally listen to the wise ones in time. And then an unlikely hero slays the beast or solves the crime, the alien spaceship is destroyed or sent packing, and life returns to the way it was before. The end. Roll credits. A happy ending. Now, aside from the obvious problems and omissions in those rather formulaic plot lines, there are some larger truths, some analogies that we can draw with current events. But one thing that is absolutely missing from those horror movies, something I'm sure I've never seen, is the part where folks say, oh, if only I'd use the time more productively when I was hiding from the monster. If only during that time that we were being stalked and taunted by the evil creature, I had worked on my Spanish, learned to knit, lost 30 pounds, baked all my own bread. I so wish I had made better use of that time when we were under siege, under attack, and aware that at any moment we could all die. No, nobody says that. Frankenstein's monster gets loose and the people hide. The blob stalks unsuspecting people and folks hunker down, barricade themselves against the threat. Survival is the focus surviving the existential threat. Haven't we all been living under a threat like that? The coronavirus lurking like a monster, like a creature from outer space waiting to enter our cells and turn our own immune systems against us, killing hundreds of thousands of people all around the world. I'm not exaggerating. We have all been under siege, hunkering down against an unseen enemy. Now, on top of all that, do we really need to beat ourselves up from not being more productive during the months that we were so afraid of what lay just outside our door? Some folks were incredibly productive and creative during this time, painting, knitting, baking, writing. Fabulous. What a wonderful thing. For others, surviving one more day was all we could do. Some of our children took to virtual learning like a fish to water. For others, it was difficult to keep up, to get up, to show up. Some parents worry that their children have fallen behind. But beloveds, they survived. They learned about themselves, about the world and their place in it, about what they truly need to flourish. These are valuable lessons. And they'll catch up on algebra and French verbs and SATs. One year in a lifetime. And so what if you gained some weight, ate too much takeout, you survived. Soon there will be garden ripe tomatoes and sunny days on the water. You survived. Over 595,000 people have died in the US from COVID-19. And if you are here today listening to this service, you are not one of them. That is enough. That is everything. Surviving is thriving. The vaccines are being administered. We are going to get through this, finally. One year ago, in June of 2020, we were heading into our fifth month of living with the novel coronavirus, what was becoming a global pandemic. 
When it first arrived here in the U.S. around February of 2020, mostly in the Pacific Northwest, some understood almost immediately that this was going to change life as we knew it for many weeks, even months to come. The rest of us, and I include myself in this latter category, could really not fathom it. At the end of June, I was packing up my apartment in Norfolk, Virginia, and a congregant dropped by with a box of masks. I thanked him, of course, but I knew I was not going to need all those masks. And this was that time when masks were in short supply, and while I appreciated the gesture from my congregant, I didn't feel right keeping them, and I gave them to a nurse who lived down the hall. I could never have imagined that soon I would be wearing a mask everywhere I went. The death toll in the United States one year ago, June of 2020, was just under 100,000. An unimaginable number. 100,000 in just the U.S. dead. Almost twice the number of combat deaths in the Vietnam War. At one point, the daily death toll here in this country topped 3,000. 3,000 dead in one day, dead from COVID-19. The death toll on September 11th was around 3,000. Imagine that level of death every day for weeks, months. But we don't have to imagine it because we lived it. All of us, some more directly than others, but all of us have lived through a nightmare, a collective experience of loss and trauma. In the early months of the pandemic, we focused on the loss, all the proms and graduations that had to be canceled, the weddings postponed, funerals and memorial services that had to wait or be held online, which was some kind of comfort, but even the highest res resolution computer monitor and the fastest internet connection cannot take the place of a hug, of a hand on a shoulder, or tear-filled eyes that hold your gaze an extra moment in a receiving line. So much loss. Every death during the past year has been a COVID death. No matter the actual cause of death, COVID robbed us of our togetherness, and we mourn that loss. But as the days and weeks and months wore on, as the leaves fell from the trees and the ground began to freeze and snow and sleet made time outdoors less comfortable, we hunkered down. Many of us grew more isolated, more afraid, and what had been collective loss became, in my view, collective trauma. Day after day after day, worrying about getting the virus, getting sick, or worse, not getting sick and then passing it on to someone else. Every sniffle, sneeze, and sore throat became a cause for alarm. People, and this is the worst thing of all, I think, people became a source of fear. People could spread this to me. And let's just agree to put to one side for the moment any conversation about the former administration's disastrous, harmful, irresponsible response to this public health crisis. On top of fear and sadness, many of us also felt a sense of betrayal. My country is a land of promise. Our leaders care about our well-being and will do everything in their power to keep us safe from harm. That stopped feeling true. At times, it felt like the very ground beneath our feet could give way at any moment. It's not good for a person to live in fear chronic, unrelenting worry about the future, about basic safety. We have been through a terrible year. And we cannot yet know what the full effects will be until we are truly, safely on the other side. 
As a child, I enjoyed being outside, riding my bike, playing baseball and football, and in the winter we went ice skating and sledding. And I enjoyed those things too, but I was often cold, especially my feet. Polar fleece hadn't been invented yet. I was thinking about this, about being outside in the winter time and my cold feet, and I remembered that often the worst part was when I came inside and my feet would begin to thaw and it would hurt. One day, I must have been in first or second grade, I was at a friend's house after having spent some time outside on a cold winter day. We had come inside to warm up. Now, this was a family with eight kids, four boys and four girls, and one of the older boys, it was Ed, if you must know, teased me about something. That's how we interacted. The older kids teased the younger kids, and usually I took it in my stride, but this time when Ed teased me, I started to cry, and the mom came running in, probably thinking that one kid had slugged another. She saw me crying and Ed looking completely baffled, everyone baffled about what the matter was. My feet hurt, I said, mortified that I could not contain my tears. Later on, I let Ed know that it wasn't his fault, that his teasing wasn't what had made me cry, that I was just tender and come on, I was only seven years old, I probably figured that if he felt bad, maybe he would think twice before he said something mean the next time. It struck me that we may, or some of us may now be entering that time of thawing out, of realizing just how cold, how sad, how lonely, how worried we have been. Some of us will jump right to rejoicing. Hallelujah, we can go back to normal, back to school, back to work, back to church. And we will come back, and there will be rejoicing. But there might also be pain. Pain that we couldn't let ourselves feel or know before. So let's be patient. Let's be on the lookout for those with thin socks who might need some extra blankets, extra love, extra care. This is what we do in beloved community. We care for one another. We notice when one of us is in pain and we try to help. Over this year, we learned to be afraid, to be extra cautious. We may also need to learn that we are safer now and I say safer, not safe, because one of the things that this global pandemic has taught us is that a virus can cross an ocean, can cross time zones, fences, walls. We are all connected. As much as we might wish for a superhero or a precocious teenager to come and save us from the monster, we are all we have. We can choose to harm, or to ignore the suffering of others, or we can choose to heal, to build more health, more safety, more justice for everyone. That's the world I want to live in, the world I'm so glad to be sharing with you. Congratulations on making it through this year. You survived. This is how the stars get in your bones. This is how the brightness makes a home in you as you open to the hope that burnishes every fractured thing it finds and sets it shimmering. A generous light that will not cease no matter how deep the darkness grows, no matter how long the night becomes. May it be so. Blessed be. Amen. Ashe.
Beloved, I am grateful for this time that we have had together this morning. As you go forth from this moment made sacred by our shared intention and attention, may you let yourselves remember that we are nearly there. We have nearly made our way to safety, and we got there and will get there together. As someone said last week, what a beautiful word, together. Peace and love to you.